Welcome everybody to the special year seminar on theoretical machine learning at the Institute for Advanced Study. Today we are delighted to have Professor Eric Xing as our speaker. Eric is a professor at Carnegie Mellon University and the founder, CEO, and chief scientist of Petrium Incorporated. He is known for his contributions to problems models, distributed machine learning, and computational biology. He's best known for pro proposing the problem of metric learning and developing the first methods. He's the recipient of the best paper awards at SDM, ACL, and ISMB, and the ACM Symposium on Cloud Computing, a Sloan Research Fellowship, and an IBM Research Faculty Award, and is a fellow of the IEEE and the AAAI. He served as the general chair and the program chair of ICML, a board member of the International Machine Learning Society, and an action editor and associate editor of various journals. Today, Eric will tell us about a blueprint for standardized and composable machine learning. Please welcome Eric Singh. All right. Thank you, Kurt, for the very generous introduction, and uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, the wonderful uh, program of uh, IAS. Um, today, I'm going to talk about uh, some of my uh, recent effort in, in building uh, a, a blueprint for standardized and composable machine learning. Uh, before I dive into the contents, maybe just to give you a bit of context, and I've been teaching machine learning at CMU for many years. And uh, with the ever increasing volume of uh, advancements, you know, in various areas in machine learning, it's becoming harder and harder, you know, to cover all the topics, and also the theories and uh, the applications are uh, becoming quite divergent. Uh, many people want to focus one way or the other. They were challenging me uh, on why I need to learn this theorem or why I need to learn that application. Uh, are they relevant to broader applications or analysis and insights? So to address many of these issues, even in my class, and I was forced to uh, look at many, many of the algorithms and models and theory and also applications. And uh, I find it uh, quite uh, entertaining and also rewarding to uh, look at them uh, kind of under the same kind of uh, framework and try to see whether there are uh, regularities and unity behind it. So that basically leads to uh, today's talk. And this is a joint work with uh, one of my uh, favorite students, uh, Zhi Ting Hu, who is graduating this year and uh, will be a faculty at UCSD next year. All right, so let me uh, start with some broader context. Well, I guess uh, these days, you know, AI, people are expecting AI to do a lot of things. You know, the tasks that uh, uh, have been given to AI range from autonomous driving to uh, dialogue systems, to scientific studies in biology, you know, in many other domains, and also healthcare and so forth, right? And uh, each of these applications usually come with uh, a unique type of data or maybe a unique combinations of uh, many uh, different types of data. And typically in machine learning, you know, for each data and each problem, you have to design a specific uh, algorithm, a model for it, and uh, you test them on some benchmarks. But uh, when, you know, you have a complex tasks, you know, that combines, for example, uh, data experiences, but also say you have a knowledge graph to give you the background and constraints. You are interacting with some agents to receive a reward when taking the action according to your model. You may have the luxury of having a, uh, say a SPAR uh, agent or partner uh, co-train with you, or you even have a adversary, you know, in a real uh, battlefield environment. It is a very, very difficult for a single model to uh, deal with all these. That's a practical challenge. And also from the methodological and theory point of view, all these data and tasks uh, have a very different behaviors and, uh, and also their you know, uh, complexity and their cost vary greatly, right? So it is very hard to analyze them you know, uh, systematically. 
So how human handles uh, handle all these problems? You know, obviously we can handle all of them, right? You know, uh, we have just one brain, and uh, the way we deal with any task is a highly integrative way, uh, in which we don't uh, think about uh, a particular type of data at a time and do them separately. Uh, how to achieve that? You know, I don't know. Maybe you know, in our brain we have all these uh, different modules, uh, like what we are uh, kind of uh, building. You know, for our machine learning agents. Uh, but still, you know, these modules, maybe a much bigger superset of this, is uh, really able to work in synergy and work in concert to, you know, have a, a very, very uh, smooth integrative experience. But uh, for a machine learning researcher, engineer, and uh, scientists, I guess uh, we are running into a much, much harder uh, situation. For example, you know, uh, you need to build a system, and uh, what's the current, uh, you know, uh, builders, say, uh, engineer or the researchers are facing is really a zoo of uh, many, many options. Uh, you know, those uh, deep learning funds may be fond of uh, exploring many types of uh, networks, you know, convolution networks, uh, you know, uh, you know, transformers. And uh, to the point where now there are uh, pre-made huge models like BERT and GPT-3, in fact, not GPT-2 anymore, you know, that offers a variety of functions, say, in the space of language. You know, all soldiers who want to provide uh, good uh, analytical behavior and the property of uh, what they build still tend to stick to older classical models you know, like the boosting algorithm, the PCA, uh, they still exist, in fact, and they still uh, operate in many application domains. And then in the middle, you know, uh, people work on graphical models of all kinds, kernel machines, and so forth. So there are a lot of things that you can choose from, right? Simply to master such a big menu is already quite daunting. Then comes with this zoo of algorithms and heuristics. In fact, these algorithms and heuristics are very often inspired by a particular style of problems, say reinforcement learning. It becomes a whole field by itself, dealing with uh, the problem of uh, learning in a real environment with uh, you know, a interacting you know, a system uh, or agent uh, that provides you the rewards uh, based on your action. But the reinforcement learning algorithms don't deal with uh, image data or, you know, uh, or NLP data per se. They they were, the algorithm were used to learn maybe uh, vision and uh, NLP models, but uh, you know, uh, for the interactive uh, uh, you know, uh, learning with uh, response, you know, say in, in a self-driving system, you need to have a different algorithms you know, for uh, visual data, for audio data, and uh, for decision making processes. Right? So it's very hard to navigate, you know, for you know, any engineers and builders. It depends really heavily on the experience of the individuals and their creativity. And usually the best you can hope is a best box solution that's dedicated to you know, a, a particular task. Uh, it almost become a piece of art in terms of how you uh, craft it. Right? And uh, then if the problem become complicated, each of these algorithms, you know, which solves a particular problem, is kind of like, uh, you know, uh, a runway that uh, can only, you know, uh, let uh, uh, a particular type of aircraft take off. If you have uh, many aircrafts, different types, you can imagine that you may, you know, uh, are in the dilemma of building, you know, an airport with uh, many, many runways, each built for one kind of aircraft. That's not the way, you know, a uh, human actually are dealing with uh, knowledge and dealing with uh, perception and dealing with tasks. So this is just the bigger context of where we are in machine learning. Uh, for, you know, actually, uh, IAS is a uh, institution that I really, really liked a lot because I used to have a physics training in my undergraduate year. For an unrelated reason, I was reading recently the founding stories of IAS, and 
I realized that uh, one of the founders of IAS, Dr. Flexner, was uh, an admirer of, uh, of uh, a theoretical physicist uh, named James Maxwell, right? James Maxwell lives in the uh, 1860s, I guess. Uh, and the, the world he was facing at that time in physics was perhaps uh, quite similar to the world I just described, you know, in machine learning AI. You know, there are dozens of theories, you know, uh, for electricity and magnetism, you, you, know, you know, the Coulomb's law, the Ampere's law, the Horati equations, and so on. And there are also uh, theories, in fact, a very, you know, disparate series about uh, uh, the light, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, uh, presents a particle theory, and there are also the wave theory, and then people start to look at uh, the law of gravity and lights and so, so forth. There's a lot of, lot of, uh, you know, uh, you know, theoretical, uh, you know, platforms and paradigms. So what Maxwell did is that uh, he, you know, uh, looked into all of them. At, uh, at some point, he was able to uh, provide a roadmap for uh, reduction, unification, simplification. I guess, uh, you know, the first set of uh, Maxwell equations like this, you still have a, a, a dozen equations, but uh, they start to introduce uh, notation systems and symbols, you know, fields, you know, and uh, uh, energy and so forth. And uh, the overall framework of uh, partial differential equations so that uh, all the theorem, you know, are summarized in a uh, kind of a similar style so that they can be uh, placed next to each other for a inspection. You can start to see similarities and other things. You know, imagine in our machine learning world, we actually have uh, even now, haven't even now unify the notations. You know, the single concept about uh, variational approximation has the name of uh, variational distribution, uh, inference network, uh, inference models, uh, maybe uh, decoders, you know, all these things. You know, for a beginner, it is, even maybe for an experienced person, it is uh, hard to even recognize from the name that they refer to the same thing, right? So that makes the, the comparison very, very difficult between different uh, words. Okay. And then... So, like, one, my favorite instantiation of Q is to take Q to be 2 to the K, and then this says that STA of uh, M over 2K is at least 2 to the K. <laughs> right, so here we have... Uh, I couldn't uh, get all your voice, but uh, uh, so, sorry, are you asking a question or making a comments? I, I think she didn't realize it if she wasn't muted. Oh, okay, sorry, that's fine. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so you know, once this uh, you know Maxwell equation was in place, you can actually recognize a lot of the symmetry you know, uh, say many, you know, uh, uh, you know, in the, in, if you use a vector form in the, and the apply vector analysis, you will recognize rotational symmetry and so on. You actually were able to even uh, further reduce this set into a much simpler set, you know, like this, right, which uh, works on all directions. And then furthermore, with the introduction of uh, Special relativity and other you know, later developments, uh, the, the sets can be even further reduced. Therefore, you know, uh, in physics, there's always this desire to describe the whole phenomenon using as few equations as possible. And at the end of the day, you don't actually need to learn too much to be at least uh, knowledgeable you know, in physics. And then you can instance it into specific fields. And you can maybe even recognize the previously you know, unknown you know, connections and behaviors. So with that, you know, I want to ask, in machine learning, uh, is there such a uh, standard equation, say, which uh, can inspire, you know, a, uh, a, a blueprint style design, you know, of loss functions, of uh, solvers, and of architectures, which are maybe the major ingredients of uh, study nowadays in machine learning field. Right. So this is basically you know, uh, the context of today's talk. I want to present to you uh, some uh, 
uh, some thoughts on how to come up with perhaps such a standard equation and also get the work that we have now more organized and also expose opportunities for new work. Okay, maybe the loss function is a great place to, to, to get started because, uh, you know, loss function is uh, very often time the genesis of uh, many kind of uh, capability for engaging with new data, uh, driving the learning algorithm and also validating the outcome. So I would like to propose that uh, a generic, you know, uh, standard equation like loss function may look like the following. It has to have three components. E stands for experience of arbitrary type, including data. I will give you examples about how they look like. D stands for divergence, which uh, can be a vehicle to kickstart a learning process. And the H represents uncertainty, which uh, could be a self-regularizer, a regularizer to control model complexity. So let me uh, start with some classical example to see how you know, this uh, possible standard equation can accommodate and explain all known results and maybe inspire new results. So let's look at, uh, say, the maximum likelihood estimation as an example. This is one of the most classical learning paradigm. And we all know that uh, there are two modes in this uh, paradigm. One is known as a supervised learning where all data are labeled. You can write down the likelihood function quite easily. And then there is another mode where only a part of the data is uh, labeled, is observed, the other is uh, latent. Therefore, your likelihood function, your objective will be a little bit more complicated because you need to marginalize over the hidden random variables. And then there are algorithms, in a sense, heuristics like EM, which uh, imputes the latent data so that you can go back to the supervised setting using solvers like ASGD. Right? So this is uh, you know, a, a pretty simple framework, but it has been used uh, in many, many uh, incarnations for more complex problems with more and more tricks introduced into all these algorithms. So let's see the alternative way of looking at this problem. One of the alternative uh, way of looking at MLE is the maximum entropy view. Under the maximum entropy view, uh, you can actually uh, write down the loss function just as the channel entropy of uh, the target distribution. And then suddenly under you know, a, a new uh, constraint of measurement framework, the data now becomes you know, uh, uh, a constraint. That is uh, telling you that uh, your uh, modes under the distribution to be learned, if you assume exponential family of distribution, uh, must be constrained by equivalence to the sample average of uh, you know, the moments. Right. So this is a constraint which allows you to essentially throw away the data and can only keep sufficient statistics. And then you can you know, uh, use this framework to estimate the parameters either in a closed form or using some SGD type of uh, iterative procedure. The same maximum entropy framework can be further uh, extended to uh, reformulate the unsupervised MLE framework. In here, uh, another idea was very interesting and was used, which is the existence, the introduction of a auxiliary distribution, which represents the posterior of the hidden random variable given the data. And uh, with that being introduced, your loss function can be uh, lower bounded by these two terms. One is the entropy of the, logic of the auxiliary distribution, and the other is a you know, cross entropy you know, of your uh, auxiliary versus some target distribution. And why this is interesting? Well, this is interesting because uh, suddenly, you know, you are having two optimizers rather than one optimizer theta, which is the model parameter. And that two optimizers opens up uh, a alternating gradient procedure that makes the algorithmic kind of uh, uh, operation a lot natural and easy. For example, let's say the EM algorithm in here. The EM algorithm amounts to the two steps of a gradient descent in the Q space and also in the theta space. And in the Q, you can use uh, one of the terms 
in the loss function, the KL, uh, to minimize. And then, you know, in the M step, you turn to the theta, and then you maximize, you know, the, the cross entropy between Q and P. So this is like providing a set of letters, you know, for people to climb, you know, a steep wall using a, you know, bouncing, you know, and uh, projection kind of approach, which uh, makes every step analytically a lot simpler. And also it can inspire very naturally some, you know, uh, approximation tricks people usually already use, but had a hard time to appreciate its, uh, its operation or its in in instinct. For example, in variational inference, we say that uh, Q may be too difficult uh, to compute. Therefore, I need to restrict the family of the Q. That means this particular you know, space of Q gets uh, redefined a little bit so that uh, they can assume a mean field family, for example, or some other you know, uh, structured mean field family to simplicity. If uh, computing the PL, the KL between the Q and the P still is too difficult, even when you assume, you know, a uh, simplifying Q. By the way, this Q could be also a, you know, black box neural network that you don't need to even know, you know, the inner, you know, anatomy, but you know a algorithm of, uh, say, back propagation to compute a gradient, that's also fine. But what if uh, with all this uh, approximation, this uh, KL is still difficult to, to, to compute? Then the other trick invented by uh, Hinton called the wake and sleep is essentially flipping the orientation of the KL so that you are no longer computing the KL between Q to P, but the, now from P to Q. And then suddenly, you know, the calculation becomes simple. So you can see with this a new formulation defined by entropy related terms, algorithm becomes very natural to be designed. And then there are many other tricks I don't have to time to cover, but they all make use of this new insight. Therefore, by reformulating a problem using some new uh, kind of uh, uh, objective could already inspire innovations in the algorithmic and in the utility space. So just a summary, there is a deep connection between MLE and the max entropy, which uh, allows uh, ideas in the inference and the, in the algorithmic space, you know, to be arising more naturally. Okay. Now, I want to run through another classical example before I dive into the master equation form. The other uh, very well-known uh, learning paradigm, you know, is known as the posterior regularization, which is a uh, uh, advanced way of uh, performing Bayesian learning. Right? We all know that uh, Bayesian learning a base rule can be rewritten as a constraint optimization by minimizing you know, a KL term between the posterior and the prior plus some uh, cross entropy. And then the constraint is just a trivial constraint, which says that the posterior has to belong to a natural distribution of space. In posterior regularization, you can basically uh, redefine the constraint using uh, data, for example, you know, uh, the margin constraints, you know, uh, in resulting from a predictive, uh, you know, uh, outcome and so forth. And uh, then the posterior regularization becomes a constraint optimization problem like this. You have a entropy term over, you know, uh, the auxiliary posterior distribution of arbitrary form. You have a cross entropy term, you have uh, you know, some slack variable, which uh, can be used to accommodate, you know, the constraints of arbitrary type. And at the end of the day, you can write down the posterior in a very interesting and intuitive form, which combines the prior and also the likelihood and also the data experiences in a single, you know, additive exponential form. And then, of course, if you normalize it, there are a lot of additional uh, hairy tricks and uh, uh, difficulties in estimating this, which actually uh, results in some other innovation I'm going to discuss in a second. Now, taking along this line, you can actually can do more than Bayesian inference. You don't have to be a Bayesian to use posterior regularization. For example, you can design the auxiliary distribution Q over arbitrary subset of random variables of interest and also not observed. And then you can basically use this uh, generalized PR to 
you know, learn a posterior distribution or learn the model, you know, theta, you know, simultaneously uh, with uh, more complex data constraints. In here, I give you a specific instance where the constraint comes from uh, the first order logical rules, you know, which uh, tells you a pattern of uh, data instances behaving in a certain way. And therefore, they can be taking an expectation over the posterior to generate a constraint. And this framework leads to a uh, uh, algorithm which also looks like EM. In the E step, you are going to now uh, have uh, uh, a uh, posterior that is uh, integrating the current form of the model estimation, P theta, and also the data. And then in the M step, you re-estimate the model parameters based on a cross entropy of the current Q against uh, uh, the, the, the previous step of a uh, data model. And uh, this framework actually is very general. And this is a phrasing. You can actually also Okay, cool. Sorry, uh, my machine is running slow because of some, uh, okay. So the, the unsupervised MLE actually could be also rewritten in the same framework. The only difference is that now you can introduce uh, uh, a new type of experiences which is directly defined on data instances as a delta function. When you see a data point, you basically you know, uh, uh, activate a constraint and when you don't see that and you ignore that constraint, therefore data can be also viewed as a constraint. So that's basically you know, uh, what uh, the PR framework offers you to subsume a number of uh, known learning tricks. So with that, I guess uh, we already see the emergence of a standard equation, which looks like the following. It can be described as a constraint of machine problem where the objective is uh, consisting of uh, a divergence function between a auxiliary distribution Q and also a target distribution to learn P. And there is another term known as the entropy, which defines you know, uh, some intrinsic properties of uh, the Q. And then there is a set of constraints, which, uh, you know, uh, uh, provides uh, some regularization over the target distribution to be learned. And equivalently, you can use uh, a Lagrangian uh, technique to write this whole equation, constraint multiplication formulation as a grand Lagrangian, where all the terms come together to provide you a unconstrained optimization framework like this. And I call this a standard equation, which uh, has uh, primarily three terms, each of which I'm going to speak a few more words about. The first term F is uh, a, uh, uh, what I call, I call it an experience function, which we already see a few examples, like uh, the data experience and also logical rules. But soon you will see that uh, other experiences like the rewards, uh, like the adversarial effects can also be you know, uh, captured in this term. The second one is uh, called a divergence term, which kind of uh, gives you a, uh, uh, a, a distance function between two uh, competing distributions. One is the auxiliary distribution Q, and the other is the target distribution P. And they actually function roughly like a teacher and a student. The Q distribution is responsible for subsuming any new experiences into its uh, configuration. And then by minimizing the divergence be between the teacher model and the student model, the students can also learn such experience you know, from the teacher and from the data in a natural and incremental way. And the last one is the, Q, is the, is the uncertainty term, which uh, you know, provides uh, a control over the complexity of the model. So now we 
then I'm going to you know, uh, use this uh, standard equation as a vehicle to see how they subsume a number of uh, existing very well known, but uh, uh, a, a, you know, a seemingly very different framework and see how to start from there to design new technique. We already see this, the unstressed MLE under the standard equation can be expressed as uh, you know, a uh, constrained automation problem with uh, experience set to data instances. Right. And uh, the supervised MLE is uh, roughly the same, except now that uh, your data experiences uh, uh, is uh, on completely observed data. And uh, this actually is already leading to some interesting new innovations. Imagine that now your data is uh, not necessarily only coming from uh, uh, the training data set, but from a Oracle that you have control over. And then also for each data experience example, you can associate that with uh, some kind of a prediction uncertainty, which uh, gives you a sense about uh, the utility or the quality of the data. And then you just uh, you know, uh, make use of uh, this uh, uh, composite experience you know, under this master equation or this uh, standard equation. And suddenly, if you run through the EM algorithm, you will see that uh, this uh, eventual formulation recovers what is known as active learning. The loss function and the procedure look exactly the same as uh, what people do with active learning. Going a bit further, now imagine that uh, your data uh, X and Y is uh, corresponding to states and actions you know, in a reinforcement learning environment. And then your, target your data distribution basically becomes a state distribution. And now let's uh, introduce uh, a new uh, experience, which is uh, say the cumulative rewards resultant from uh, state action pairs. Okay, here is a definition. And then you let your experience function to be equal to this uh, cumulative experience. It turns out that once you plug this into the standard equation and uh, go through the generalized EM algorithm I just described, you will recover a very a uh, good number of algorithms known as the RLS inference published in these papers. The equation looks the same. You don't have to re-derive it. And the more interestingly, if uh, you uh, play a little bit further with uh, uh, the experience, the form of the experience, say you take a logarithm of uh, the cumulative reward and make that as the experience function, and then you plug them back into the standard equation and run EM, you suddenly see that uh, in the M step, you are going to you know, uh, adopt this update equation, which is actually the same as people use in uh, a, uh, another set of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms known as the policy gradient algorithms. So just by basically using the standard equation and uh, plug in different uh, experiences, you already can generalize the same framework to cover a number of uh, originally very different learning paradigms. Now let's see, what if we make some additional adjustment of uh, say uh, the divergence function, this middle term, okay? Originally, I think we were playing with the experience function. What about uh, do something with the divergence? Say we define the divergence to be the jensen shannon divergence between the auxiliary and uh, the target. It turns out that uh, in this case, once you run your EM algorithm and uh, in the M step, when you want to minimize the, the JS divergence, there are a number of techniques that I use. Let's take one of the, the recent uh, uh, more clean ones known as the uh, probability functional descent. I'm going to say a few words more when we discuss uh, generic algorithms. But PFD is a technique which allows you to uh, solve a optimization problem in the space of functions. One of the key techniques it uses is to basically uh, redefine in the original functional loss you know, using a term called uh, uh, influence function, which can be resolved from uh, solving you know, a, uh, a conjugate dual problem 
you know, uh, and introducing some dual functions like uh, some conjugate functions like uh, the, the, the Psi. Okay. And uh, once this uh, Psi function is uh, taking a, uh, 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 this uh, if pi function can take a specific term like this. Uh, sorry, okay, my laser pointer phrases. Let's say the the the, the conjugate function uh, can be now chosen in this particular form, where you know you parameterize that function using a neural network, okay, and uh, it could be arbitrary, but uh, uh, we basically use uh, this uh, cross entropy style kind of uh, uh, formulation as the, the conjugate. Then suddenly, you know, your influence function becomes uh, that discriminator people often described, you know, uh, in the generative adversarial learning framework. And then your end problem is going to be a minimax problem, you know, over this uh, influence function, which exactly recovers. The vanilla gun training, where you can alternating between training the generative function and also the discriminative functions. So again, by just you know plug in a new divergence term with the same data, you achieve you know uh, the the gun type of a training effect instead of a maximum likelihood training effect. In fact. Uh, the algorithm I just described now is not quite convenient because uh, you need to understand uh, PFD, you need to manipulate uh, the conjugate function in the influence uh, uh, function, and then you need to do a fair amount of mathematical derivation. A alternative approach is to directly working with a richer set of experiences to make it uh, not just uh, data instances, but uh, directly adversarial effects, uh, such as uh, uh, misclassification error, but not binary, but perhaps uh, multi-class misclassification, uh, transfer effects, and so forth. And with that, you can actually recover a wide range of uh, uh, gun model variations. Here I gave you a few examples, you know, by putting the divergence function to different forms, say at F divergence or a Warsaw stand divergence you actually could recover the F gun and the W gun. And uh, when you plug in the new data experiences to reflect that kind of uh, adversarial effects, you actually could get uh, a lot of uh, different, uh, you know, uh, mathematical behavior, you know, in those uh, new gun framework. So I'm not going to go on and give you more instances, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, if you just follow the general skeleton of the uh, standard equation, you can pretty much recover most, if not all of the existing popular learning frameworks. It's like, you know, unifying all this uh, with this tree rooted at the standard equation. And uh, for more details, there is a table that is ever growing where we put in the specific forms of the F and also of the D and other things. Or you may ask, do I already cover everything in machine learning? Well, not yet. This is a growing list. There are still a number of frameworks which uh, we haven't figured out how to cover yet, such as uh, the entire space of uh, meta learning. And also in lifelong learning, we haven't worked on uh, its compatibility with the standard equation framework. But I believe you know, this is a, a, a interesting body of uh, future work, which eventually could uh, benefit the community by bring in some order, you know, into this uh, very divergent and, uh, and uh, uh, messy field of uh, different innovations. From the UT point of view, having a standard equation really uh, leads to a lot of benefits. One of them is to allowing you to uh, learn with uh, combinations of experiences. Imagine that you design a F function, which has a weighted sum of all these different experiences. Usually they have to each invoke a new algorithm, say in reinforcement learning policy gradient and in maximum likelihood learning, you know, a, uh, a back propagation and so forth. In here, you pretty much can you use a single algorithm to solve them, you know, uh, with, uh, with one attempt. So I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, how exactly that can be done, you know, uh, in a second, but that actually already drives us to the algorithmic issue, how to solve 
such a standard equation if we just want to focus on you know what to use and do not want to focus on how to use other kind of uh, uh, workhorse and black box solvers for the standard equation? Well, I guess um, I don't know yet. Obviously, there is a zoo of uh, solvers out there. Many, many algorithms are designed in very specific settings, uh, so especially in reinforced learning. You already see, you know, uh, say, uh, policy gradient being advanced into proximal policy optimization and, uh, and so forth. There are many, many specific techniques. Um, among many of these techniques, I guess uh, one of the uh, particularly simple uh, uh, choice is uh, this uh, alternating gradient method, which I found to be uh, adequate to drive uh, a large portion of the needs you know, for solving the standard equation. So here is how the solution looks like when you apply a uh, alternating gradient descent into a primal form of the standard equation. It leads you to the extended EM function like this, where you know, in the E step, you update the Q, which uh, integrates data with experience and so forth, and the, uh, the earlier form of the model with the new experiences and uh, renormalize it and the form what I call a teacher type of capability or maybe a refreshed teacher. And then in the M step, you are going to now minimize uh, a divergence function uh, between the teacher and the students so that the students can assimilate this knowledge you know, by updating its data and this one can alternate. This idea uh, seems to be uh, kind of uh, good enough for a majority of the needs in solving the standard equation or the paradigms covered by the standard equation. And also, um, it allows, uh, it, it provides a template for additional innovations. In each of these steps, you can do, play additional tricks like I you know, indicated here, you know, to further kind of uh, uh, improve stability of the algorithm uh, and also uh, to improve maybe, uh, uh, say, uh, convergence rate and so forth, which I'm going to give you a few examples in a second. But there are some limitations as well, you know, for this algorithm. Uh, for example, uh, if you replace the term of divergence into some more fancy divergence, like the Shannon Jensen divergence or Wasserstam, stem, uh, you, don't, you no longer see this uh, beautiful EM form. You need to see something more complicated. There are some advanced techniques, as I said, which uh, gives you additional uh, uh, bonus or uh, rewards, uh, even if you apply them to the standard equation. So here I'm going to just uh, mention a few, which could be interesting new directions in the theory side to, to push the limit. For example, you know, uh, convex duality is uh, a nice technique once you have an explicit uh, uh, loss function, such as the standard equation here, you can really uh, exploit convex duality to get some uh, nice effect, such as the kernel tricks. Right? So here is an example that uh, we did many years ago. You know, with uh, the in, you know in the you know uh, uh, scope you know in, inside the framework of the posterior regularization, if you set the data constraint in a to be a margin constraint, you are going to get a posterior distribution of uh, the data of the model like this, which actually will be using you know, a weighted sum of uh, those margins. Okay. And we all know that uh, this actually provides uh, a uh, opportunity to uh, explore uh, what those uh, uh, sum of margin actually look like algebraically. It turns out that once you flip the coin and uh, study this uh, equation in its new space, only a few support vectors will matter and others don't. Therefore, you have this uh, support vector effects where only a few Lagrangian multipliers will be non-zero, you know, because of the complementary slackness effect. Right? And also in the dual space, you know, your loss function takes a very interesting uh, quadratic form, which allows now the originally 
uh, linearly interacting features to cross interact, you know, through this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this uh, quadratic form. And therefore, they bring in the opportunity of, uh, you know, uh, modeling the dot product between feature vectors using a kernel function. Therefore, you suddenly allow experiences to interact in a nonlinear fashion. I think this is a great opportunity. How to allow rule-based features and the uh, adversarial features, reward features, to start interacting in a nonlinear fashion? That's an open problem we haven't got a chance to study. Another trick of uh, exploiting convex reality uh, is uh, what I mentioned earlier, this uh, uh, technique of uh, uh, probabilistic functional descent and also the magic of uh, influence function. So just like in standard equation, it is a function, it's function of functions and the optimizing in functions of, uh, in the space of functions is always very difficult. And uh, you know, in probabilistic functional descent, you know, if you use, if you apply Chateau differential to the loss, you actually could express, a, you, could, you could derive a approximation to the original functional, just using, you know, a set of uh, functions, okay, uh, expanded over a reference functional point. Okay, so that's basically the idea about the influence function. It is a function, not a functional, therefore, it's naturally more easy to optimize if uh, you can use it as a surrogate of the original functional loss. And uh, say, if you are able to solve you know, uh, this uh, uh, inference function by solving you know, uh, you know, a dual problem, then you, know, uh, you could uh, really uh, you know, reduce the original problem into you know, uh, re uh, minimizing you know, the expectation of uh, the influence function. And that basically leads to a new interpretation of uh, the adversary learning, which I showed earlier, right? Once you, you know, introduce uh, a particular parametric form of the conjugate function in this way, where you can plug in black box, you know, discriminator functions, uh, you know, uh, uh, of uh, arbitrary kind of uh, inner anatomy, but uh, as long as it takes the data and output uh, some uh, good uh, you know, label that can allow you to define you know, the, the descriptive loss, then your influence function will take this a uh, very nice form, you know, which is it's basically you know, uh, the loss function over the discriminator. And then once you plug in this uh, influence function back to you know, the, the master optimization problem, you get this uh, nice minimax problem where you, know, you are you know, maximizing uh, the discriminative parameters over you know, a discriminative function. And then you are going to minimize you know, the resultant uh, generative model you know, uh, you know, uh, over the theta, which are the parameters over the, you know, over the, the generative models. So in a sense, you have uh, you know, this uh, unified framework of uh, doing joint generative and descriptive learning as a result of uh, playing with uh, this uh, uh, convex duality algebraic uh, trick, you know, in allowing you introducing new forms. RL is another example. You know, if you are able to you know, uh, use, uh, you know, define the loss function to be like this, and then you can get an inference function, which is uh, pretty much look like uh, the expectation of uh, the re cumulative reward function. And then as a result, you can automatically derive what is known the policy gradient descent algorithm just by directly applying you know, the minimax formulation I just described. Okay, so I don't have a conclusion on whether we have a master solver. Maybe you don't want to have a master solver after all because uh, you do want to have multiple runways you know, for different uh, problems. And I call these algorithms the runway. But at least now the runways is are broader. They can basically be used for several different uh, learning paradigms rather than one. I think uh, that would, and also there, they provide the space for further innovation. I think uh, that's you know, uh, one of the benefits I see coming from a uh, standard equation perspective, that you have a more unified field 
for people to carry out algorithmic study. Last but not least, with this uh, you know standard equation where you know uh, you know uh, loss function is not taken care of, and the optimization framework is taken care of. What's left is to plug in the specific functional forms of uh, what the p should look like, how theta should be parameterized. These are you know in the space of uh, model architecture innovation. And I believe much of the research nowadays, especially in applied conferences like CVPR and ACL, are primarily focusing on coming up with novel designs or synthesis of these kind of models. Uh, but I think this field, uh, this direction has been very well established and uh, well served. There are many, many building blocks you know, uh, of all kinds, say in the space of deep neural network, you can you know, uh, find yourself uh, you know, from TensorFlow library or other libraries, all these uh, activation functions and the layers which allow you to you know, uh, you know, uh, combine and the synthesis and the compose. And you can go one granularity up and uh, combine you know, networks of networks to a compounded functions. And here is just uh, you know, one such example of uh, starting from uh, some basic embedder, some basic uh, perceptron and the, and the, and the, and the, and the convolution layers, all the way up into different forms of uh, encoders and decoders, and uh, finally a classifier. And again, this uh, practice is uh, very well kind of uh, uh, established, and I don't want to say too much about that. But uh, I guess uh, the key issue is about how to train such a thing once you compose that. Now we have the standard equation to allow you to define in a very systematic way the loss and experience and the uncertainty and also upon which the algorithm can be deployed. It. Graphical model is another set of components and we know, you know in early days that uh, you know, uh, the very definition of graphical model allows compositionality already. You can build bigger models from small models. And uh, there are also now you know, uh, systems allowing you know, uh, models of models to be combined. Here, for example, the encoder and decoder, you know, can be connected in the graphical model framework as a chain graph, so that, uh, you know, feedback effects, priors, and uh, multitask setting can be all, you know, uh, uh, implemented. So just to sum up, I guess uh, with uh, the possibility of uh, using a standard equation to uh, summarize uh, all different learning frameworks, you get uh, you know a lot uh, of clarity and cleanness you know in at least uh, systemizing you know the parody of machine learning and also in uh, deploy uh, efforts you know in the algorithmic design and also in the model architecture space you you can use the vast library of building blocks for compositionality a lot more easily. So next, I'm going to start uh, uh, maybe providing a few instances of uh, practical applications, you know, built on such a blueprint view of machine learning. You know, you may wonder already, you know, after all this uh, 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 discussion, many of which actually may not even be a new result, which is probably results you already know, uh, but uh, in basically a context specific way, what is the utility of putting all them together? Well, here I just name a few. I think one of the major utility provided by this standard framework is that now finally you can clearly and explicitly combine you know, different experiences so that you can learn in a much richer context. You have the mathematical vehicle to introduce a complex introduction, uh, interactions between experiences such as using duality, complex duality, and the kernel tricks. And also, you may have the new capability of uh, allowing uh, a, another level of learning, which in my opinion is uh, less explored, but uh, more realistic and uh, needed, which is the multi-agent game, the game theoretic learning. Because, you know, for example, when you learn a system, say a recommender system you know, to, a, to, a, to a, a particular consumer, you don't want to assume that you are the only recommender you know, the user will see. There are other recommenders, maybe recommending in the same space. When you are driving, 
it's not like only your car, you have other cars on the street. You may want to communicate and see what's the uh, response and the consequence of uh, you taking a particular action. So all this basically means that the agent need to not only make a decision based on what uh, he sees, but also based on what uh, responses he or she got from uh, interacting uh, or community agents. And that means you need to have the capability of synthesize all these different experiences. And in the past, all these different experiences were handled separately with different framework. Now with the standard equation, I see a possibility of uh, using a uh, kind of a much cleaner and a compact mathematical parity to integrate all such so that uh, a game theoretical agent can be better defined. So I'm going to maybe show examples of uh, just a few of these, maybe focusing on learning with all experiences and uh, leave the others to be open topics for discussion. So learning with all experiences actually uh, requires now empowerment of algorithms, where algorithms used to work in a particular data set on a particular type of learning problem has to go you know, beyond the boundary. And that's actually possible under the standard equation framework. For example, you know, if uh, you want to uh, learn the rules you can actually combine the rule experiences, okay, in the uh, posterior regulation framework together with uh, a reward experiences, you know, from the reinforcement learning work, framework so that when you apl apply a rule, you get a reward in terms of its effectiveness. And then there are tons of algorithms, you know, in the reinforcement learning space to learn based on rewards. You can basically use that algorithm, say a positive gradient algorithm, to now start learning rules. Right? So that's basically one application we've actually uh, experimented and get some nice results, you know, which actually allows uh, a conversational system to be trained on much smaller data set, uh, which uh, uh, rely less on instantiation, but on given rules you know, uh, provided by the experts. You can also apply the same trick on supervised learning where every data point can be associated with uh, a weight or a reward so that you can achieve data augmentation. Not all data are treated equally. So this is again achieved by combining the reinforcement learning reward with the data and using a policy gradient algorithm. Another challenge uh, is in a totally different uh, paradigm, say in, uh, in the generative uh, universal network learning. Uh, one of the major technical issue is the stability of the algorithm. It turns out that this uh, particular learning framework, because of the mathematical nature of the loss, which is the JS divergence, most of the algorithms are suffering from uh, extreme instability. You are over tipping a little bit, then you crash, something like that. Well, in other domains, such as reinforcement learning and uh, in unsupervised learning, you know, versional inference algorithms, policy, proximal policy gradient optimizations and other techniques has been widely developed to tackle the stability issue in those learning paradigms. And they haven't really been heavily used yet in gun or adversarial learning, right? So how about uh, we, again, combine these three pieces together and uh, form a compounded experiences which allow the algorithm to be repurposed, right? So here are some results. You can see that uh, comparing, you know, to a, uh, kind of a conventional, you know, uh, you know, gun learning framework. And the now, you know, uh, integrating them with, uh, you know, uh, you know a, uh, a reinforcement learning type of uh, training paradigm where we provide a surrogate of the loss function, which are more compatible with reinforcement learning. You can see this, uh, you know, uh, platoon or saturation effect, you know, and stability effect, you know, uh, you know, over, the size of the interpolation. You don't actually get divergent once you are crossing a particular size. You actually you know, have a, you know, a sweet spot where you achieve the mass, maximum outcome, but uh, without uh, kind of uh, tipping off by staying within or beyond that boundary. In another setting, uh, we also, uh, this is by using you know, uh, some of the uh, state-of-the-art uh, you know, PPO, you know, the, the proximal gradient algorithm, uh, policy gradient algorithm. In here, you can also use uh, other techniques to stabilize gun training, such as uh, important sampling based reweighting algorithm for data, 
This is a well-known technique in VI, variational inference, for many years. And uh, once you now recast the, the GAN framework, the loss function, like the one in VI, using you know, a shared standard equation like a common objective, you actually could uh, deploy such uh, important sampling, importance weighted algorithm into training GAN. And you can see the comparison of the improved stability in both the, the, the generative model loss and also the descriptive loss. So this um, you know, opportunity of learning with all experiences, you know, practically is very, very uh, rewarding. I know I just want to show you a few experiences. You know, by composing you know, this uh, f function as a weighted sum of uh, experiences from say data and the rules and rewards, you suddenly can achieve uh, some uh, very uh, uh, interesting effects. One is in uh, one example we had is in language training, uh, in, in a conversational system training, where we want to uh, uh, produce a agent that uh, uh, have a behavior called uh, controllable text generation, meaning that uh, your generation of a text will have uh, not only the content but also follow certain rule uh, defined by prior knowledge, have uh, the right sentiment you know, in the communication and so forth, in addition to following just a trivial language model. It could be a very rich language model like the GPT-3, but still that is not going to give you all these additional effects. So why this is important? Because, uh, you know, you know when, you, when, when, when we are training, you know, a language generator, uh, if you really have a vast amount of data to train, you know, uh, the GPT-3 type of big model, you may be able to capture all uh, desirable behavior. But uh, if you have a small training data set, especially in rare languages, this kind of rules, this kind of sentiments is actually going to impact the performance of the, the model substantially if uh, you get it wrong. Therefore, you know, you can integrate them without just using data example. You can integrate them using rules or other kind of a more soft rules with a reward to get the training, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, reaching a desirable performance faster. Maybe the next example gives you a more visually appreciable kind of uh, benefit of learning with multiple rewards or multiple uh, experiences, say this time, uh, image generation. You want to uh, build a uh, you know a virtual try-on model, you know for online you know uh, uh, clothes shoppers. You know how do you how do I put a clothes you know uh, on top of you, right? Well, this the core of this of course is a, a gun model that generates uh, you know the, the 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 image of a person you know wearing different type of clothes. But you also want to generate the image in the way that they have all different gestures, right? They may be, you know, uh, front view, side view, they may raise their hands and so forth. Well, in your training data, you may not have uh, so many data points showing individuals of different kinds, uh, putting up different gestures and wearing different codes. That's actually a very, very uh, difficult uh, data set to collect. But now, you know, you can, you know, uh, collect uh, rules that describe human pose, that, uh, you know, when they are posing in different ways, how their body parts, you know, uh, position relative to each other. This can be described by rule rather than by, uh, you know, using data examples. And then you incorporate this rule into that small number of data examples, which shows, you know, the look of the clothes and the look of the person. And then you can see basically, you know, uh, the training, the, the improvements of the training results. So this is a base model. Without using the post rule, you can see that, uh, uh, yeah, it's very hard to look. You know, somehow the, 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 the parts of the body are misplaced and the boundary are not really uh, dealt with uh, in a nice way. And uh, you can also plus fixed knowledge. Say you just, uh, you know, write, uh, hardwire some rules into your neural network and say, hey, the head has to be on top of the uh, shoulder and so forth. Uh, these are again very brutal. And uh, when some people take, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, a, a, a wear something that is not appeared before, 
the machine can be confused and uh, start to misplace the body parts. But uh, when you use uh, the learned knowledge, with uh, basically you know, both the rule, their rewards, and also the example, you know, these are three sets of experiences, you will start to see you know, the results behaving better. Again, these are achieved by using just a small amount of training data. And that basically you know, uh, leads to you know, maybe a, a, a aspiration uh, or maybe a need you know, for really you know, uh, optionalizing, operationalizing you know, conventionality in machine learning. I guess with the master's equation in place and with a few driver algorithms that provides the runway for multiple different models and instantiations, and then with the architecture's uh, library now available in many open source repository, there may be an opportunity to start designing you know, such a compositional platform. So in my group, you know, uh, one of my students, uh, Zhi Ting, actually built such an open source repository called Taxa, which focuses on uh, language model compositions for NLP-related applications. And uh, you can see the architecture of that is exactly you know, uh, designed like a catalog of uh, all different losses, all different architectures and the building blocks. And then at the end of the day, the user will be able to use, unfortunately now there isn't a graphical interface, but a proven interface where you can call different modules and, uh, and uh, there are intuitive APIs for you to you know, uh, stitch together different model parts so that uh, the same model, you know, uh, say a language model, can be trained based on likelihood, based on reward generated from blue function, and based on adversaries due to the gun mechanism. So this basically allow a larger model to be assembled piece by piece with uh, either pre-trained or separately trained, you know, model components. It's a very different uh, concept versus uh, you know, that so-called end-to-end black box gigantic model that uh, uh, some kind of uh, researchers and uh, practitioners are fond of. I believe, you know, when you really go beyond, you know, our current limit and uh, tackling more and more complex problem, a compositional approach probably gives people more potential to, uh, to address the difficulties. So with that, and getting closer to the end of the talk, I guess you may ask, you know, uh, where this whole kind of uh, endeavor is going, right? So are we going to unify everything in machine learning so that we only need to know one equation and, uh, and, then, uh, and then stop from there? I don't know. I guess uh, it's uh, really uh, uh, depending on, you know, uh, uh, the needs to the field and also uh, what we encounter along the way of uh, building this uh, unification framework. I want to actually provide some food of thoughts, you know, coming from the physicist, right? So in physics, uh, because of uh, maybe uh, their character and uh, also, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the value prop, you know, in those fields, the physicists really appreciate, you know, uh, the, the eventual kind of, uh, uh, presence of a unifying theory. Because, you know, for example, this uh, Nobel laureate, uh, you know, physicist, uh, Phil Anderson, once said that, uh, you know, physics is a study of symmetry. You just study it and you provide the symmetry. And, uh, you know, you can, if you look at the, 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 the timeline and the, the way, you know, modern physics evolved from the past, starting from Maxwell's equation, this uh, effort of unifying different uh, physics uh, you know, uh, paradigms and theory has never stopped, right? You, you know, built on the Maxwell equation, you know, Einstein come up with the general theory of relativity. Then later on, there are the standard model from Young and Mills. And uh, I guess, you know, right now with the unification of a weak force, strong force, electricity, and the accepted gravity, people are hoping to see you know, a theory of everything, at least in the world of physics. Now in machine learning, I don't know, are we hoping to see a master algorithm that basically solves everything that we're gonna face? And I, honestly, I don't know. People are talking about the artificial general intelligence from both functional point of view and from a uh, technical point of view. I think right now, 
it is still very elusive to talk about the future you know, uh, of having a master's equation or having a standard equation for everything. But I guess what I just presented uh, could uh, be seen as uh, offering a uh, way of thinking. It's a unified way of thinking that you systematically understand you know, previously less connected or disconnected machine learning paradigm so that you can start borrow or repurpose result from one place to the other to make them less siloed, to make them more usable, right? And perhaps it also can lead to some automated solution creation by you know, composing the model based on pre-made building blocks. And I believe uh, with that effort, the accessibility of uh, machine learning can be a lot wider uh, you know, to you know, uh, data scientists or maybe even to uh, specific you know, uh, less kind of sophisticated users. This is actually happening in the world of physics. You know, you know, electricity, for example, right now, if you want to wire a house, you don't have to have a PhD in physics. You can basically have a high school diploma and uh, you read the manual, you can pretty much wire a house pretty competently, right? And that's not happening in physics, uh, in machine learning yet. And I'm hoping that uh, maybe uh, this could be an inspiration for us to pursue that unified view. So I want to end you know, by, again, posing some additional you know, theoretical open questions that could uh, be uh, asked you know, on top of uh, the standard equations that I just uh, talked about. In the past, you know, theoretical analysis in machine learning uh, make heavy use of uh, limiting assumptions on data and uh, on environment and on model behavior smoothness and everything. Uh, and they are very limited in a sense that they cannot provide uh, very strong guidance in designing complex systems such as an autonomous driving car and so forth. Hopefully with the, you know, the usage of uh, a standard equation like kind of uh, objects, which uh, allows people to integrate experiences to unify different algorithms, uh, we can you know, look at uh, our uh, previously disconnected uh, uh, machine learning problem in unity and uh, in synergy and maybe provide bounds and uh, complexity analysis, stability analysis in this new lens. For example, I would love to see analysis on how to qualify uh, learning with rules. You know, uh, how confident we are going to tell people that uh, a particular rule you know, uh, is uh, uh, more uh, plausible than the others. And also the definition of a consistency needs to be revisited. Consistency to what? You know, is uh, MLE style consistency the gold standard to qualify every other learning algorithm or there may be something else resultant from uh, the standard, uh, standard equation definition. So with that, I think uh, I'm going to stop here and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm open to a few questions. Right. Uh, let's thank Eric for the very interesting talk. Um, so we do have a few questions in the chat box, so I'm going to go over them first, perhaps. Um, so the first question is from Rohit Goswami. Um, the question is, uh, what are the guarantees uh, which can be formulated using a master equation? That is, is there any benefit apart from pedagogical unification of phrasing or programming in this matter? Yeah, that's a great question. That's exactly what I was uh, trying to put on the last slides. There, unless you reduce the standard equation to a uh, uh, basic MLE instance, you know, or maybe a uh, Bayesian inference instance, uh, current theory does provide some guarantee in the sense of uh, consistency and error bounds. But uh, I don't see any work yet you know, uh, in looking at the standard equation in it's a more general way, say providing, I think I think some work also uh, take place in the GAN framework where your, your standard equation is only insensitive on the Jensen channel divergence. But a combination of uh, all experiences and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I, I don't see a nice characterization from the theoretical side of its behavior. What I show so far in the standard equation is that uh, it, by setting the tuning parameters or the choice of, uh, uh, of uh, the form of uh, different terms in a certain way, you recover 
you know, uh, existing solutions. But what's more interesting is to go beyond that. You plug in some kind of uh, more arbitrary or more creative uh, design, you know, uh, in the building block. And uh, I didn't talk about, for example, the alpha, beta, you know, weights of all these components in the standard equation. When you start to play with uh, those dimensions, I actually don't know what's going to be resulted yet. You know, we haven't really played with that at this point of uh, exploring the entire open space of com compositionality. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Varun Sivashankar. Um, the question is, do you think a theory of everything for um, machine learning will need advances in theoretical math as well, uh, or will it likely depend on pre-existing uh, math? Uh, sorry, uh, uh, can I um, read the question? I didn't catch uh, all of what you read. Yeah. Uh, let me repeat. Um, the question is, uh, do you think a theory of everything for machine learning will need advances in theoretical mathematics as well? Oh, okay. um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, theoretical mathematics, or mathematics is already a theory, <laughs> theoretical, is so advanced that uh, many of the tools are not even, you know, employed it, you know, in analyzing machine learning. You know, for example, the, 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 the probabilistic uh, functional descent using the, the Gato differential, that was uh, a mathematical technique in the 50s, it was very, very classic. But the two machine learning people, it appeared to be new, right? So I, I feel that uh, uh, we probably don't want to go invent uh, new mathematical tools before using the existing ones you know, to analyze, you know, this uh, more realistic and the more rich format, say the standard equation and see what we get. And uh, if we hit a wall, which I am not uh, very sure that will happen, then maybe new different, uh, new functions, a uh, new mathematical technique need to, need to be made. Thank you. Um, so Rohit has a follow-up comment. I don't know if you wanna I mean, yeah, please. Yeah, if, maybe you can just unmute them. We can even have it become conversational. I'm yeah. fine with. Yeah. Um, Rohit, if you want to unmute yourself. Um, no. Okay. Um, Is it, am I audible now? Yes, you are. Yes. Ah, okay. Right. So uh, what I was trying to get at is that you know when you, when you think about the electromagnetic equations or something else, then they're closed form, right? I mean, they're 100% equivalent or something in that manner, right? So like being able to express or put in all ML models in a standard form is not the same as uh, that being useful yet, right? I mean. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in mathematics, you know, in machine learning, I guess uh, you're right. You know, many of the techniques, uh, they could be uh, expressed in a standard equation, but uh, uh, it's more like a symbolic equivalence rather than a real mathematical equivalence. I guess that's what I'm trying to get. And therefore, um, that's why I'm saying that uh, maybe what we are, what I was referring to as unification is not about uh, really mathematically they become the same thing, they become a single thing. It's really about uh, the way you look at it. I guess you look at different things from the same lens will give you some kind of regularity, at least uh, with uh, uh, the advantage of uh, being theoretically more easy to analyze and also being algorithmically more easy to operate. Yeah, but I don't claim, for example, that the gun learning and the, the maximum likelihood are the same thing. No, I, I, yeah, mathematically they are different, but uh, they, they, they have the same kind of anatomy and the dynamics, you know, uh, in their design. Yeah, oh, wonderful. Thank you. Great. Um, so we have another question from Yashra Tan. Um, so this is a follow up to Varun's question. Um, so have you ever thought of category theory or um, other existing tools you've developed in the past half century um, uh, in the context of machine learning? Uh, for example, CP is often sold as a mathematics of compositionality, though thinking about it, I also understand that deep level analysis may be 
be over 40 if you're committed to thinking about composition in the usual algebraic sense, adding functional terms. Wow. Uh, I have to acknowledge my ignorance. No, I, I know this term, but uh, I haven't uh, really looked into CP yet. But thanks for the suggestion. I think I'm going to take some time to read into that. Right, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, maybe let me ask another question while uh, members of the others are thinking about their questions. Um, so I guess you advocate an interesting view of variational inference in the sense that uh, classically it's often viewed as approximation to maximum likelihood, whereas uh, in your framework you seem to be suggesting it's uh, you know the objective, um, you know, a good objective in its own right. Um, I was wondering if you have thought about, um, you know, possibly uh, relaxed notions, right, of optimality that can be uh, derived, for example, using your mastery equation um, as a result of considering sort of variational inference as um, sort of the objective um, that you want to optimize. The question is about uh, what to uh, relax the. Yeah, so maybe let me clarify. So, um, yeah. you know, so usually, I mean, maximum likelihoods, um, you know, we are able to establish consistency, right? Because, um, you know, uh, precisely because we aren't actually making approximations, right, in the variational family, right? The variational family actually contains the exact posterior. Um, but now, of course, um, you know, uh, when it's intractable, you have to consider uh, retrieval variational family. And in your framework, at least uh, if I understood correctly, right, um, you're proposing sort of viewing this sort of more general uh, notion of primary estimation, right, as sort of, you know, a tool that you want to use. Right, right. It's right, uh, not, not as your question. Yes, right. yeah. So, um, you know, variational inference, you know, uh, has been, <laughs> in, in, in a sense, this notion has been abused in many ways, like ranging from a redefining the proxy family to be very limiting, like a mean field, uh, yes. or changing the objective to be different from its original, like uh, the reverse KL, so that at the end of the day, your objective uh, may have nothing to do with the original objective. For example, it doesn't have to be a lower bound of the original anymore. Therefore, you may not get the model one. So yes. that actually uh, leads to the theory analysis really hard because uh, consistency convert consistency at least is uh, easily defined. It, it consists to where I don't know. Either com e even convergence is also un unknown because uh, it may have uh, strange oscillating effects and other things depending on what relaxation and what the engineer would do. Yeah. yeah. So I guess uh, uh, in the with the standard equation, uh, I would say. At least you know where you introduce the approximation a lot more explicitly, right? right? And uh, and uh, therefore you could uh, start uh, making remedies, you know, of those approximations where you actually want to do the analysis. For example, I would say, you know, when when you know this a whole encoder decoder business. Originally, when I taught it, it was uh, mysterious because. Uh, the mathematical form and the objective was kind of lost. You know, right. it, it becomes a self-training of uh, arbitrary direction. But now you actually see that it is about replacing you know, the posterior with a variational and then replace the variational approximation with a network, which is to approximate something. Right? But uh, the loss function is still, say, you know, in the VAE form, for example, it's, it's still the original likelihood. That's good. And then we can hope that the VE, uh, the, 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 the variational autoencoder at least uh, have the potential to be proven convergent or consistent once you tighten the approximation. Mm -hmm. But you also know that uh, you know, uh, the GAN framework is a totally different thing. You know, even though people put the VE and the GAN next to each other to be two adversarial things, mathematically they are completely different. Okay, they don't converge to the same thing, by the way. And uh, they learn totally different entities. Right? So I think uh, with this uh, nice uh, kind of explicit form of the standard equation, I was hoping that people know what they're doing. <laughs> and at least uh, at the end of the day, say more kind of explicitly about achievability and non-achievability. Right. Thank you. Um, and Rohit has a follow-up comments or question. If, uh... 
It's more of a comment. I, I was just wondering if like the way we represent these formulae math numerically for a computer when you program them, that can be somehow abused to show that they're equivalent in some sense. If not mathematically, then numerically mm. or something. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> that's a that's a good question. Uh, numerically, at least I wouldn't uh, 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 kind of speculate that they are uh, they are equivalent because their laws. You know, if you write them down, you will see that they are so different. They are, they are completely different. And uh, uh, of course, we we can say that we don't actually know the closed form. Uh, you know, numerical value of the loss. Therefore, even though they look this different, they may be numerically the same value. That's possible. But, but uh, well, at least uh, that's also useful because uh, you can, in the future, maybe build a simulation program to know what to simulate and maybe get a target number out there for your validation. Yeah. So I, I guess the, the major value of having a standard equation, having a blueprint, is really to provide almost like a charted map you know, on the landscape, people know where they are when they make a choice of uh, a algorithmic choice or a model choice, you know, or some other, you know, uh, you know, uh, manipulation. They at least are not lost. They are not thinking about that they are say in 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 Alps when they are actually in Rocky Mountain. You know, that kind of a mistake couldn't don't have to be generated. Right. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, if there are no more questions, that concludes today's seminar. Let's thank Eric again for the great talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>